My first poem has a lot of English in it, but there are three or four sentences that are in Cree. And um, this, the English will give you a sense of what the Cree means. So this poem I wrote for my father. It's, it's called Perfect, Not Perfect. Past Perfect. If I had understood a bit of Cree, a bit of how Cree had shaped you, I might not have misunderstood you. Present perfect. I have tried to make peace with my tribe, as a wise woman once advised. Future perfect. When I finish this task, I will have learned not to frown, but to lean into the perfect pitch of your speech, your voice, tamarack, timpani. Neka kakwe tapati imson. Neka kakwe wanaskan. Thank you very much, uh, Ms. May. Feel great. Well, we'd like to share with you, this is a very informal, it's a dialogue, so feel free, folks, to come up close and personal, or as they would say in those TV shows, come on down. <laughs> um, because we're going to be dialoguing with uh, Ms. McKillery about her creative vision and artistic development uh, through a catalyst of what seminar members wrote yesterday evening um, in our dialogic workshop. Now, the first thing I should tell you is the poems that we went through are from her latest book, uh, Kia, which is available in the bookstore. But I should also tell you uh, the methodology, our modus operandi, as the police would say. How did we commit this act of crime? The people in the seminar did not know who they were reading. I never told them the name of the author, nor the title of the book, nor the name of the poem. Rather, I would take a poem, photocopy it, and remove every reference so that they simply had the words which had to stand or fall on their own merits. And then, um, since we're going to be listening to the music of Nick Howells, as performed by Professor Slush um, in, a, in a little bit here, um, and it, it, this is going to date me by saying this, but we took a new kids on the block approach. That is to say, we went step by step. <laughs> um, I handed them the piece of paper face down, and I asked them first, would you please read it straight through and write one word? After that, I said, would you please read it a second time straight through and write one sentence? Then I asked them, would you please read it a third time straight through and write one paragraph? Then I asked them, would you please read it a fourth time, straight through, and as in a stream of consciousness vein, would you please write everything that goes through your mind when you read this piece of writing? Incidentally, I should point out, I never referred to the writing as a, po as a poem or an excerpt, always as a piece of writing, so that they have simply the words rather than the form as inflecting their reading of these words. Um, then I asked them, would you please write a tweet about this piece of writing? And it, it cannot exceed 140 characters. Then I asked them, would you please title this piece of writing and tell us why did you title it that way? And then I asked them a word in the piece of writing would you please give your definition of how do you define, and you'll find out what the word is in just a minute, 
So, like the new kids on the block, step by step, we'll go through how one seminar member experienced the poetry of Naomi McIlroy, even though they didn't know her name, or the title of the book, or necessarily that it was a poem. One word, respect. One sentence, he or she is undertaking a journey to perfection. One paragraph, only on the third reading did I pause to take in the creed words. Perhaps a journey to perfection will take time and reflection. The stream of consciousness. This is a beautiful poem. I'd like to get to know the author. Her healing journey, her struggles, and how she came to find a way, her way, to redemption. The Aboriginal story, post-colonial contact, seems to be a very sad one. This past seems to be irreversible with so many stories of abuse, neglect, poverty. Yet, somehow, this poet has blessed that past, made it perfect by a simple yet heartfelt voice of understanding, gentleness, and forgiveness. The present has been made perfect by the author's attempts to make peace with her tribe. She does not say that this has been accomplished, but that she has tried. She has tried to follow the elder's advice to make peace. The poet looks to the future, envisioning a time when she will recognize perfection of another human being. Tweet number one. This is good. Tweet, Cree, Cree poet. Tweet number two. Perfection can be found in this mess. Tweet, First Nations history. Tweet number three. Why not make your world perfect? Tweet, healing the past. They titled your poem, Healing Song. The author has given us a vision on how we might heal our past, present, and future. The healing remedy he or she offers is simple and gentle, almost childlike, hence song. Well, we invite you to respond. Thank you, Dr. Cornett. Wow, that's a lot of stuff there, and it, it's, I feel quite affirmed. Um, it's interesting, the wise woman who uh, once said, you know, make peace your with your tribe was actually a student here, Janice Truman. Uh, we don't, I can't remember what we were talking about, but she said that, and it stayed with me. Um, is that all the writing of one person? Yes. And I should also mention to you, recall that in the, the end of the step-by-step, step, New Kids on the Block, is I asked them to define a word. What word do you think I asked them to define in that poem? No, that was the one, the first word that came to mind of that person. Perfect. I asked everybody in the seminar to please give their definition 
here's what the same person wrote. Perfect. An object held by love. So I, I feel quite, quite good by, by what you've shared with me. It, it, um, as a poet, most poets try to say as much as possible in as few words as possible. Um, so, as I think in Paul's class yesterday and in today's Lunch and Learn um, session, the poems have, they each have a story behind them, and that story has a lot more words. And so the poem is quite short, but the piece of writing is quite a bit longer, or the different pieces of writing are quite a bit longer, and they, They make me feel good because it shows that what I was trying to do in the poem, I actually managed to do that. That the person who wrote all those pieces um, understands me and what I was trying to do. So that feels good. Now folks, this is a dialogue. It's a collective conversation. It's not a monologue and it's not just the two of us. So, and the technician has graciously provided this uh, microphone that we can pass around. Uh, again, I want to invite you to come on down, come close, it'll make it easier to give you the mic. And we'd now like to ask, invite you to ask questions, keeping in mind that the principle of dialogue is this, the only wrong question is the unasked question. So, please, questions? Thanks. So you had the, uh, the people read it four times through. Yeah. Um, I, that makes me think of uh, the four directions. Was that intentional or coincidental? Um, uh, it's what I call, uh, how do we open up the mind to create a relationship, a dialogue between reason and imagination? And uh, I, I, in all honesty, and I, I, I should tell you that as a religious studies scholar, my area of focus, uh, my specialty, uh, in which I publish, research, um, and speak, is the relationship between aesthetics and spirituality. Um, and I, I want to be honest here that I, I'm working, I began first working with the seminal child psychiatrist on D.W. Winnicott. Now, Winnicott is one of the foundational figures uh, in psychiatry. And Winnicott wanted, in the course of his research of child uh, psychiatry, he wanted to understand how does a newborn, I mean right out of the womb, that's culture shock, <laughs> how does a newborn make a relationship between the internal and the external, between the womb and the world. And Winnicott, after much research, proposed that, that the newborn does this through what he calls transitional objects. For example, in Charles Schultz's uh, comic strip, Peanuts, Linus has a blanket. A blanket is a transitional object that enables the newborn, or the baby, or the child, to build the bridges between themselves and their world. Um, and Winnicott also proposed, of course, that the mother's breast is a transitional object that enables the newborn to make the connections between internal and external. What I propose in my research on the relationship between the aesthetics and spirituality, and spirituality in a sociological uh, sense, broadly defined, I'm not talking here about dogmatics or institutions. I'm talking about the human condition as essentially spiritual. And I propose that in fact, the arts create a transitional space between the material and the spiritual realms so that the aesthetic constitutes the threshold of spirituality. So in effect, to answer your question, um, as a historian of the history of religion, um, I studied the work of Ignatius Loyola, the founder of the Jesuits, the Society of Jesus, and we now have the first ever Jesuit pope in the world. Um, 
Ignatius Loyola wrote a little book when he was extremely uh, sick and thought he was going to die. This little anthology is called Spiritual Exercises. So why do we go through this once, twice, thrice, four times? Because in effect, we contemplate the arts as a spiritual exercise. So it's accessing some of the dialogue partners that I've worked with in literature, refer to what we do as deep reading. Um, how do we peel back the layers? This one poem is the result of a long, indeed perhaps a lifelong process. So how could we retrace the steps that brought the poet to this point? Well, it behooves us to take the time. Socrates said, the life unreflected is not worth living. We take the time to reflect on the other. And it becomes a mirror for the human spirit. Other questions? I mean, Rajan had questions. As a participant in the seminar, I really appreciated the chance to go over the several times. So uh, I have a two-part question. The first is, would you read the poem again? And then, would you comment on the three temporal perfections that the poem reveals and talk about that? Thanks, Rasha. Those lights are pretty bright. Perfect, not perfect. Past perfect. If I had understood a bit of creed, a bit of how creed had shaped you, I might not have misunderstood you. Apoi tu kwe, kaki, so kid, kute hitama, kanituta, ta. Present perfect. I have tried to make peace with my tribe as a wise woman once advised. Iwi sani hito ya uma kia nao kiwa kawa kumiye. Future perfect. When I finish this task, I will have learned not to frown, but to lean into the perfect pitch of your speech, your voice, tamarack, timpani. Neka kakwe kapate imason. Neka kakwe one ka. Thanks for asking me to read it a second time. Um, when, when I was reading this poem, I was thinking two things. Um, one thing is I have in mind for another book of poems, not in Cree, but to play around with grammar, to write poems about all the rules of grammar as a way of teaching. So I was thinking about different uh, tenses there, the past, uh, the present, the perfect. And so what I did was in each of the, there are, there are three verses, I put it in, into the past, if I had understood you as past perfect. And present perfect is, I have tried. And then future perfect is, when I finish this task. So I was thinking about the grammar there, and it fits so nicely into where we've been, where I am now, and to envision something better for the future. So I appreciate the question. Thanks. Other questions? Please, this is the chance. Everything you always want to know about poetry, but never dare ask. Well, we'll make the most of all. Oh, no. here's, here's another seminar member. Uh, just read part of this. In the middle of the stream of consciousness uh, uh, component, um, another seminar member wrote this. Can we actually preserve or hold on to the past? And is it better to live with cultural amnesia? And their tweet, learning Cree is not only about learning a language, it is also about encountering the other. The title they gave for your piece of writing, Cree Jugation. 
instead of conjugation, quejugation. I think that it fits, and it's darn witty. <laughs> My definition of perfect, to encounter another without barriers, prejudice, or fear. So I invite you. Thank you. Uh, would it be okay if I just looked at the first couple of things you said there? Is it, can we actually preserve or hold on to the past? Or is it better to live with cultural amnesia? So I think that yes, we can and we have to. We have no choice. We cannot forget. We can't leave it there. Uh, if we don't remember the past, I'm not a historian, um, and I, I wish I was a historian. Um, we can't we can't forget things like the Holocaust. We can't forget that there isn't only one Holocaust in human history. We have to remember those things, and if we don't remember them, then we just keep making the same mistake. So the answer is a resounding no. We cannot live without the past. And if you just look around, it's a, it's a recent phenomenon. Uh, who do you think you are? Ancestry.ca. People hunger to know who they are. Um, and I'm a person who has a European, like an Anglo-Scottish past. Both are my mom and dad, and they have an Aboriginal past. Korean Ojibwe through my mom. And Aboriginal people are quite disconnected through our colonial history. But anyone who is, has a European past, who's been here for more than a couple of generations, the traditions get watered down, and people are hungry to know who they are and who, who I am is who came for me. Um, and to go for, I had to do this to go forward. So that's how I respond to that. Questions? This is all of us participating. It isn't just myself and uh, Ms. McGillray. We invite you. Please, you're part of the dialogue. Yes, Ms. Parker. Okay, I guess I'll ask this question now. <laughs> uh, I've also been uh, mulling over, struggling about that. And, um, and the sense of, uh, you know, with all humility, the sort of why you or why me, why my particular history, right? Even though that there are some peculiarities of my individual family ancestry, uh, we are a flow of refugees or, you know, others have experienced similar history. Um, and I understand fully, I actually would add to that, that not only not to repeat history, but to heal the generations from that. I mean, this is what I've learned from the now that my mother's dead. Uh, what what, what um, pain she carried through her death in some ways can be released through my living with my so is it worth it? Because it's a lot. It is a lot of work, right? It is, um, can you tell your own story within your own family? But when you, are you leaving it to the world now, right? And I can see the crafting that you put into it. Is it worth it? Um, and the answer is a resounding yes. Um, this, I will, I'll be reading the second poem that I'm reading after Milton performed uh, Nicholas Crowfoot, um, is a poem I wrote for my mom, and I had to ask, it's a very difficult poem, and I had to ask her permission to, I had, this is hard, this, this is really hard. Um, the response has been just unbelievably positive, but the two or three negative criticisms were unbelievably so I carry that with me, I carry that pain with me, because then it, it uh, shows me the pain that my mom has carried. And my mother is very private, and um, this has allowed her, uh, she and I, to talk, and for me to, for her to share her story with me. Um, and that, that's really worth it. It's a real gift. Yeah, so it's worth it. You mentioned, Ms. McGillray, that you're not a historian, but you want to reclaim your past. As a historian, the reason I gravitated to literature 
is historians must always verify based on the primary sources, and it has to reflect those primary sources. But I began to realize that if we were going to come to terms with the issues raised by history, we needed the freedom of expression that literature provides. And I guess what pushed me into it, uh, I went to the University of California, Berkeley, and when you'd walk into the history department, there was a quote right above the chair of the history department's office. And I have never forgotten that quote, and it pushed me into literature. The quote is from Goethe, the great German thinker, literary figure, who wrote, what we learn from history is that we have learned nothing from history. Think about it. <laughs> Other questions, comments, observations, please folks, let's make the most of this unique moment. Yes, thanks for raising your hand. What sort of inspirations did you have writing this in regards to maybe previous literature you've read, maybe some experiences you've had uh, that kind of defined your work? Thank you for that question. Wait, what's your name? Jerry. Jerry, thanks for that question. I don't think you were in the audience this morning or at the lunch time, thing, so um, I commented that I sort of been, I think I've been on this journey for a really long time. When I was a kid, I did an assignment. I was 12 and I did this crude English dictionary. And my dad, the irony is my dad was not, my dad was white. I hesitate to use that word. I don't think that word is, is really an adequate word because it's, people think I'm white until I say I'm Métis. Um, anyways, he wasn't, he wasn't Cree, but he spoke Cree. But I'm Cree and Ojibwe and all that from my mom. And so there was this assignment and I put together this little dictionary. He didn't write in the language, he just spoke it. So we went around the house and he repeated the words however many times and I wrote them all phonetically. So that was a long time ago. Um, in my study of literature, I started to ask um, some of the pieces that we were writing or reading. We read, in one of Paul's classes, we read Beloved by Toni Morrison. And that's a long, long time ago that I read, but the image of the, the slave has the, the, uh, the whipping scars on, on his back or her back. It looks like a tree. It looks like a family tree. Uh, that image stuck with me. started thinking about um, the, this irony in our family. Who, who are we as not native? We're not white. What are we? Who are we? Um, that, what Janice said about making peace with your tribe, Mm -hmm. Yeah, I needed to make peace with my tribe. Taking Cree classes, hearing the language. Um, I, not quite a year ago, last June, I was invited to the um, the Rubuku Aboriginal Arts Festival in Edmonton. And that was about a week before this book was launched, and I was very anxious. Um, because I knew in that audience there would be a lot more Aboriginal people than in most of my audiences, and I knew that a number of those people would be fluent Cree speakers. And I've tried to be honest, I'm, I'm not a fluent speaker, but I'm trying to come to terms with who I am in my past. And I was really, really, really nervous, and I had a kind of an epiphany. I, I realized that the anxiety I was feeling must surely be like one-tenth of the anxiety that an elder feels when she's saying a prayer in Cree and, and I'm sitting right beside her and I'm leaning in and I can't hear her. So I realized that some older fluent speakers of the language, they, they're scared to speak it because of their experiences in residential school. That, just that realization helped me keep going with this. this. This rested for five or six years and just put it away because that's how much it hurt. Um, but then the publishers were interested 
and um, it's a lot of work. I took an hour out this morning and got myself ready to read again. It is, it's really a lot of work. Um, but realizing that my anxiety was somehow connected to the pain that people who speak in indigenous languages but, but are afraid to speak it because of the, the experiences they had, that really helped me a lot. In, we, the book was, was done already, um, and it helps me every time I do something like this, that connection. Thanks for the question. Well, um, Ms. McGillray, here's another member of the seminar. We're all reading from the same page, and here's what they wrote. One word, incomplete. One sentence, a narrative history of, our, of the relationship between two peoples. One paragraph, an explanation to correct a misunderstanding. The narrative narrator is drawing on previous experience to explain her new behavior. Their tweet, damage understood. Apology given, waiting for acceptance. They titled this Reflecting Forgiveness. Why? There's an implied apology which is seeking a response. My definition of perfect, an explanation that concisely and accurately describes a situation an event, etc. Thanks. Thanks to everyone who wrote these things and put them out there to be shared this afternoon. Is it okay if I look at it again? Oh, sure. Thanks. So one word incomplete. Uh, this isn't just a one thing. Like, it's a lifetime journey. It's a process. There was this discussion this morning, not related to what we're talking about now, except I see a connection, like talking about um, education in the classroom, how crazy it is to jam so much and how much anxiety that students go through. And, and uh, somebody mentioned that the goal shouldn't be the grade, it should be learning, the pro it should be the process. And that, that's what this is, it's not like an end one, it's not, one, it's not a one-off, it's a continuous journey that's, that's always in a process of completion. So this narrative history, this relationship between me and my dad, it, it was complicated. I didn't understand my dad. I mentioned this morning in the lunchtime series that I decided I wanted to learn to speak Cree because I think, and I think it shows in this poem, um, I really wanted to understand my dad and I realized that he was shaped by 10 years from the age of 4 to 14 growing up in Frog Lake and Fishing Lake. And that made him, that, that's who he was. So I, to honor him and to honor my Aboriginal history on my mom's side, um, I'm making an attempt to learn the language. What was this one here? To correct a misunderstanding, drawing on previous experience to explain her new behavior. Yeah, you know, I, I didn't understand my dad. I think I understand him a lot better. He wondered why I was so interested in this. He couldn't speak in the last year of his life, so that was tough. I wish I started this a lot earlier. I definitely have a lot of peace in my heart for having done this. Thank you, Ms. McGill. Other questions, comments, observations, please, because now our time is starting to move on. Well, uh, we have a lot of resource material, Ms. McGillery, thanks to your poetry that they've written in dialogue. Here's another, the same, same piece of writing and another seminar member. One word, exactly. One sentence, I feel I am always translating myself to others. And she understands what's that, what that's like. Their tweet, 
leaning in to listening to others brings the most delight it gives. Keep on talking in your native tongue. We all need harmony. My definition of perfect, I borrow it from a contest Peter Zorsky had when, when he asked, what is the definition of being Canadian? I am as perfect as possible under the circumstances. <laughs> perfect is a process of becoming authentic. So there's, there's a lot there too, exactly. Um, maybe I'll take a look at that thing. Exactly um, translating myself. So uh, we, we all want to be heard, we want to be accepted. So we behave and we talk and we do things to help other people understand us. Um, we're shaped by the music of voices of our families, the language we speak. I'm always translating myself to others and she understands what that's like. I think every, it's part of the human condition to be misunderstood. And so it's just a human, a natural human activity to patch up those misunderstandings and to work at, at being understood. And, uh, this, this is a healing journey. Um, these pieces here, I'll, I'll carry them with me and they'll be part of my, my healing. Well, I know we have at least one literary professor in the audience, and I'd like to ask you, each member of the audience, and specifically those who are either studying literature or who teach literature, I was fascinated when I read that the seminar member wrote, I feel I am always translating myself to others. I believe, in fact, that's what all literature does. Literature translates the author to others. Would you agree with that? And could we hear from those who are in the audience who teach or study literature? How would you respond to that statement? Well, I very much feel understood today. I feel very affirmed, I feel very welcomed. This, uh, this event and your response to me, these responses to me are helping to heal some of the, the pain that I've experienced in, um, in working on this journey. Uh, Eleanor Roosevelt said, you must do the thing you think you cannot do, and that would be this. This, this has been uh, really tough. I don't know if I'll ever become a fluent speaker, but it's been really uh, eye-opening, that's what I can say. Like, the, the language is so beautiful, and then all the whole world of culture that goes with the language is quite overwhelming. Now, if this were an African-American chapel, and we weren't getting, because they're, it's all based on call and response, if we weren't getting a response from the audience, the preacher would be right there at the roster saying, May I have a witness? <laughs> so I'm going to ask, before I hand you the mic, I'm going to invite you to give us a witness. Do you believe that all literature comes down to translating oneself to others? We'll venture a guess on it. We'll hazard a response. Ms. Parker. And I, um, I believe that not only because of the language, but also because of how we think. So for my example, um, I'm left-handed, I'm also female, and um, as a child, I didn't think I was any different than anybody else. I guess I had curly hair and a lot of straight hair. But the first time I noticed that, um, I needed to write with my left hand, 
Um, and so naturally they would expect that I would have to have left-handed scissors. Well, I cut my right hand. <laughs> and so um, that was my first inkling that, that we make assumptions without even thinking. And, and most of that is important. But we still want to be known. And so I think that's our call in human nature to create so that we are known. And, and literature is a fine example of that. And it, it's not necessarily about the words. It's about the beingness. It's about the presence of us. And for us to connect, um, I think lately there's more and more talk about this, that we're hardwired not only to be good, but to be to have empathy for each other. And so there's this, as you mentioned, this deep yearning. Um, and that yearning comes not only to connect with each other, but to get to our roots of who we are, and especially now on this planet. And so we are in this age of conversions where we have the possibility, literally, using the internet to connect with anybody. And the Idol of the War movement is a really good example. So resounding, yes, literature translates so many levels, not only our language. Well, yes, oh, thank you very much. So Naomi, in that, in that poem you read, you talk about grammatical structures, you know, the different perfect tenses. Um, so I'm wondering if you could say a bit about how the, the structure of a creed um, you know, open your mind to a, a different kind of thinking. Or, you know, if you think of the structure of a house, how does, how does the, the Cree house look different from um, another kind of structure? Thanks for that, that question, Paul. In one of my poems, I compare um, learning compare learning a, a new language in my 40s to adolescence, the way I the new crushes through rapids, I think. Um, it's, the Cree is, it's not foreign, but it's so, it was so outside of my experience because English is so influenced by other languages, including French. It's not exactly the same, and the syntax is a little bit different. French, but not nearly as different as it is between, say, English and Cree. Um, I am not a linguist, but I've learned enough to get myself in trouble sometimes. And so I, my understanding is that Cree is what they call an agglutinating language or a polysynthetic language. So English is called an analytical language, meaning that, um, and I am simplifying this, but um, the grammatical structure syntax is very rigid. So if I took the words I talk to you and I, I, I you talk to, that syntax is wrong. Syntax is very, very different to the Cree because we have all kinds of articles like ah and da, all these sort of little words, and they have a very, the rules say that it has to go in this place in the sentence. Those things aren't contained in the Cree language in the same way that they are in English. So, for example, um, I, I, I did that yesterday. So, or I, I, I read that book yesterday, so I put the word read in the past tense. I read it yesterday. In Cree, um, the word itself, the verb itself doesn't change. There's a prefix, he, a he, I am in how, or I did that, I, that, um, that little sound, he, puts it in the past sense, past tense. That little sound doesn't go in a certain place in the sentence, it goes right after the pre verb. It goes, it's the very second element in the verb. Um, 
the, in the Cree language, the verb is the foundation of the language. Uh, and the verb is, it's complicated enough in English. Um, and then to try and learn it in Cree. Um, so you've got like all these different, you know, first person, second person, there's the third person singular. We have all that in English, but it's just, if it's a, it was just so far outside my experience that it made me realize how, um, how important it is to, to give children the opportunity to learn more than one language. We know that um, bilingualism helps students do better in school. But we also know that bilingualism or trilingualism helps people understand each other better. And I, I'm still in this process. I wish I would have pursued it before I turned 13, but I got busy doing other things. Um, so I, I, I mean, I'm answering your question, Paul. There, it is really a different way of thinking. It is very much a different way of thinking. Like even we have, in English, he or she, we have those, the genders, he or she, and I guess in other languages they have a neuter gender. They don't have that in Cree. They don't have a he or she. So, um, you know, the word is the same for he or she reads, um, but they have a different gender for if an object is considered animate or inanimate, or it's considering considered living or non-living. So a tree is considered animate, but the wood is considered inanimate. So that, that's just one um, example of the different way of experiencing the world and the different way of thinking. 